It says, I am curious if protein during cycling is actually helping or is it potentially inhibiting my ability to take in approximately 90 grams per hour? And he says 90 grams of carbs per hour based on the one to one fructose to glucose ratio mentioned in a previous podcast. Uh, thanks for a great podcast and a training po or thanks for the great podcast and training five stars. So where should we start with this one? The whole, I've heard this before that like uh, protein basically helps it so that it, you know, your muscles don't break down mm -hmm. basically is like the, the common thing that I've heard. Yeah. Where do you want to start with this one? Uh, Chad? We, we kind of went a lot of different directions on this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so it, there's, it's an opportunity to talk about a few different things and, and some of them aren't specifically <coughs> about protein ingestion. Uh, yeah, should we talk about the study first? Maybe? Yeah. 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 Cause it, I mean, you, you read something like that and if you don't dive into the details, uh, it's it's really easy to take away the wrong information, yeah. Which is you know, just another case for why, if you're gonna hook line and sinker, sinker, accept what an extract is telling you, it's pro or an abstract is telling you, it's probably a good idea to get into the the weeds a bit and actually look at the study before you go and yes. Right. And for those listening, if you're looking at these peer reviewed journal articles, um, the way that they're structured, there's usually an abstract which gives you like a summary of the entire article, you know, they'll do like a really brief touch on the methods, the results and the conclusions. Uh, so it's a great way to kind of get a bite sized mm -hmm. summary of, of what a study is. But mm -hmm. because it doesn't offer more granular detail, it's hard to really dig into how effective their experimental design was mm -hmm. um, and really, you know, how trustworthy the results and conclusions are. Yeah. So. And, the, and there's the criticism that uh, you know, the study's old, so it's probably not up to date anymore. Or it's, it's not relevant anymore. And mm -hmm. there, there's a strong argument against that. I mean, old science is still good science in, in many cases, most yep. cases, maybe. Mm -hmm. yep. um, this would be a case where not so much, because, for instance, one particular criticism with this 2003 study, um, it's titled Effects of a Carbohydrate Protein Beverage on Cycling Endurance and Muscle Damage. It's mm -hmm. by Saunders et al. Um, <clears throat> they saw optimal fueling rates at 60 kilograms or 60 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram per hour. And, mm -hmm. we, and we've long since dispelled the fact that that's all you can absorb. I mean, if it's strictly glucose, yeah, that's the case. But now mm -hmm. we recognize there's co-transport with fructose. Um, we've now starting to see that we can push that fructose up higher mm -hmm. so, that with mm -hmm. the, so that we're going ab well above, in some cases, 90 grams per hour. So this that, that's a, it's not even a shortcoming. That's the information they had at the time. Mm -hmm. So they, they based understandings on that thinking, well, if the body can only get this much carbohydrate, then, um, maybe, and, and to their credit, they did acknowledge that maybe that protein, I mean, they closed their conclusion said further research is necessary to determine whether these effects were the result of higher total caloric content mm -hmm. of the carbohydrate plus protein beverage or due to specific protein mediated mechanisms. So they're not just saying it's protein that made this time, these times to exhaustion grow. They're saying it could be the fact the protein provided more calories, which is in addition to the 60 grams of carbohydrate they're already getting. And maybe that was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the results. Because yeah. we, we said this, and somebody said no way, and the other person said an expletive, no <laughs> something yeah, way. Yeah, she will be remain named, remain oh, nameless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it'll> help us. <laughs> uh, so what they were doing is they were writing pretty much a threshold, and the and the uh, percentage they do it always as a percentage of VO two max, but it's pretty much threshold. The, when they did when they add protein, they wrote forty percent longer at threshold. Yeah, we were like. What? Wait, like, <laughs> so I put some like people, we could all just do it, right? People have done like <laughs> you know how fast I would do this for less a percentage. Well, exactly. Like, uh, can you imagine anything? Like, if you could ride at forty yeah. percent longer at threshold with some protein, so yes. just the magnitude of that that's would crazy. make me think that yeah, like Sounds that's not just too good to be true. Calories mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know what's going on, but that would be that's a that's good insane. Principle. That's a good principle of the too good to be true thing. Yes. Um, it's, it's definitely, it still even applies to scientific research. Like if you see something like that yeah. and, and once again, it, like you said, a chat at the end, they basically say, now we don't know if this is specifically yeah, because of protein that. or mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Um, so, um, but then one, then to your point too, Amber, it's also going into the, the, the methods that they used when they were actually testing and, mm -hmm. and going through everything else. Well, you can't, a you, lot can, to, you can never cherry pick a single study just because yes. it supports your bias. It's like, Oh, I want to believe that. So that's probably the true one. Right. That's at probably, the we just stop at the possible. title in that case. We didn't even go to the abstract. <laughs> right. right. No, it's not the title. <laughs> it's the journalist who wrote about it. Yeah. 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 Their title yeah, exactly. is. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. We just go to the tweet. That's yep. it. And then it's, yep. it's taken. Right? Well, so, so two other criticisms that I didn't mention yet. Um, and one's pretty 
wide or uh, it impacts a lot of these studies. Mm-hmm. Um, first off, though, the, you have to look at isochloric versus, in this case, isocarbohydrate. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they use the same level of carbohydrate on you know, both the um, study groups, mm-hmm. um, both the demographics, but they didn't match calories. Mm-hmm. So if they had matched calories then it wouldn't be as easy to criticize. Yeah. And on top of it, I, again, I've, I've talked about this before, the times to volitional exhaustion. Yeah. I mean, Nate put it a particular way one time, <laughs> said, you know, if you can ride at this wattage for 20 minutes and then someone puts a gun to your head and said, ride for 25 minutes, you'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll, you'll find will. a way. You'll yeah. find yeah. a way. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. good day, bad day. Yeah. I mean, there mm-hmm. are times where you get on to do, maybe when we used to do 20 minute tests, you mm-hmm. knew whether or not you had it in you to do a good 20 minute test that day. It just wasn't there. Yeah. Then you come back on a good day and it is there. Yeah. So on a good day, I know you can push farther. I mean, your, your volitional time to exhaustion will increase. Yeah. They, they've done studies where like you all out say, okay, 200 more bucks if you can last one more minute. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Like everybody does. <laughs> yeah. or, or, you, or you're <laughs> at 20 minutes faster. and they tell you you're at 18 and you manage to stretch it to 20 minutes because yeah. that's what's expected. Yep. I'm going to change the distance of your TT course because you don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's something actually, so really quick before we dive in deeper into this, into the protein and carbohydrate yeah, the actual part. actual question. Yeah. Uh, but that same principle, I, 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 I don't have any sort of, you know, gun to put to head, so to speak. Yeah, and it doesn't need but, to be that extreme. I mean. Yeah, but what I do during the ramp test is I tell myself, I, I, I pull the gun. No, I'm just <laughs> I'm going to kick the door in <laughs> in the middle of it. <laughs> no, um, I actually tell myself and I, I, because so. Here, and this could vary for each person, right? But I find that, that when I test and, and when in any fitness testing scenario, um, maybe I just can't push myself as hard as everybody listening to this, but I find that whatever I get for my numbers in my training, if I bump that up just a touch, maybe one or 2%, I can still manage my training well and, mm-hmm. and I might get even more. So rather than bumping it up during the ramp test, because it's a really good format for this, because it's not once again, like a 20 minute sustained thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, during that, when I get to the point where I think I'm failing, I tell myself three more minutes. So, mm-hmm. and then, and then I just, you can do it, you can do it, just chunk it up. Right. We've talked about that plenty of times, 10 mm-hmm. seconds, 25, whatever you yeah. need to do. But I just, once I get to the failing point, I tell myself three more minutes. I haven't made it to the three yet, but I have made it further than I would have otherwise. And it, it just goes to this point that, that whatever you find, think your failure point is, mm-hmm. chances are it's just beyond that, or maybe even further beyond mm-hmm. that than just beyond. Yeah. Um, so you can always get a little bit more. I mean, that's why, probably why we always get really good numbers when we race, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been more than a few times where I'll finish my lead out effort and I'll think like that is all I've got. And then suddenly someone will attack and I will be the only person in the team <laughs> in position to go. And I will think like, I have nothing, but somehow you find it. Cause it's just, if the, if the job is there in front of you and needs to be done, you just do it. I don't know where it comes from, but yeah, it's there. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. yeah. Kate Bates actually, who is former world champion on the track one time told me when you're at that point where you, th- you think that you're dying, mm-hmm. it's a nice reality check to remind yourself how far from actual death you really are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not there yet. <laughs> You're not, not dead yet. <laughs> On the protein and carb side, Chad, like, uh, yeah, so, should we dive so into that? Because we all had the reaction that we did. Yeah. <clears throat> it was like, no way. No effing way. That's... I want to just real quick yeah. back to a couple of principles when you're mm-hmm. looking at studies like this okay. oh, before sure. we dive into this. One is um, if you see a study like this that seems like it's too good to be true, do search keywords that might bring up alternate, you know, like, um, results that are different than Mm -hmm. what you're looking for. Or if you're looking for a particular bias, search the opposite of your bias Mm -hmm. or search the opposite of your assumption and see what other studies come up that may support a different point of view. And then the other thing that you can do, especially if it's an older study like this, is you could look up, um, what studies have cited this. And then oftentimes Mm -hmm. there will be studies that either agree with it and confirm the results or actually refute the results, which is what we found in this case. So those are two things that you can kind of do to evaluate a particular study when you're looking at it. And look for reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Reviews are great. Where they combine multiple studies. You guys were talking about this and I looked on, uh, it's like PubMed or something. And it just on on the right, it says similar articles, review. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clicked on that and then. It was not mm-hmm. the, this is not the consensus, I guess. Right. I think you're going to. Yeah. Right. And this, and this particular review was done several years later. So we went from what, 2004 to now 2013. Um, it's by McClellan, Pasiakos and Lieberman's called effects of protein in combination with carbohydrate supplements on acute or repeat endurance exercise performance. 
a systematic review, and we'll link to that. Mm -hmm. um, they looked at 28 studies, um, and they all have to fulfill particular criteria, amongst which uh, ingestion, infusion of various forms of protein with carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. um, 60 grams per hour was considered optimal. So again, maybe you know a chink in their armor, but still consistent. And looked at how the addition of protein for in, in a lot of cases isocaloric so they matched for calories matched for carbohydrate i mean they, many of these did it right but they were still kind of influenced by that that 60 gram per hour limitation there were only a couple yeah. studies who exceeded it so again i mean you have to try to find that distinction between is it just more calories or was it the protein that made the impact mm -hmm. and by and large across these 28 studies they show that they're really uh, in fact to quote when carbohydrate is delivered at optimal rates during or after endurance exercise protein supplements appear to have no direct endurance performance enhancing effect that that was the conclusion for this entire review mm -hmm. not just in, in individual studies within the review that mm -hmm. also ties it down to the main objective of what we're talking about which is <clears throat> performance improvement right yeah mm -hmm. so and that's kind of a different question the way he's asking it he's asking it you know if mm -hmm. if i'm trying to get 90 grams in is it going to be hard for me to get all 90 grams in if i'm also supplementing uh, protein on top of it mm -hmm. which is what we'll talk about next and two if you so this first study had such a huge magnitude right like 40%, yeah. you think that you could repeat that, maybe get a 10% or a 20% or in there, mm -hmm. like all the time, uh, that you could get a p-value that's that's good enough uh, for this, like, but, so again, if it's too good to be true, yeah. look, research. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be great. So uh, where do you want to start, I guess, so on the protein? So first off, let's say it's percent. unlikely that it's harming his performance. And, and it actually, I asked, it's got some specific questions so we can determine just that. Cool. Um, so as far as protein and carbohydrate in interaction, um, first and foremost, as long as you have enough carbohydrate on board and you're ingesting carbohydrate, you're probably not going to do a heck of a lot of damage in terms of protein. It's yeah. not like your body just jumps straight to protein. I mean, if carbohydrate's there, any impact on protein is going to be minor mm -hmm. if it's you know present at all. Um, and, and keep in mind, he's talking one-day events here. We're not talking about chronic uh, protein deficiency. Mm -hmm. This right. is a very different topic. Mm -hmm. um, so... If he's talking about staving off intra event, so within the event protein loss, it is a valid concern. But again, not if you're not if you're not carbohydrate depleted. Mm. Um, there is something. There was some science or some research to support that ingesting protein during an event, in particular, they used whey protein. Having that present in the GI tract did allow for greater glycogen synthesis rates, but that assumed there were down periods. Mm. I mean, if it's a, if it's, if you're working, 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 I don't know that glycogen is going to synthesize at the same rate, even with protein, a protein influence, if you're doing a bunch of work, it's just, it's not really how it works. Right. Um, but as, as far as the, the ratio of protein to carbohydrate that you can get away with, I mean, a pretty typical recommendation is like a one to 10 ratio. So even if mm -hmm. you are going to supplement protein, you're not putting a heck of a lot in there. Um, and in particular, this is um, from Mike Isertel, the RP, RP diet author. Um, he says that uh, higher protein content is recommended if, if muscle sparing is, is a concern. Um, mm. A lot of athletes, especially for one-day events, it's not a big concern. So that 1 to 10 ratio is probably all you need if you need it at all. Mm. Um, if you have different – oh, actually, we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. But understand that the metabolic pathways are different. Right. Right. They're not – we're not – trying to push protein into the cell or in, in the same way they're not using the same transport mechanism. Um, it's not really going to, they're not going to impede one another. The concern is how much food can you get in? If taking the protein is causing you to be able to ingest less carbohydrate, then yeah, that's a concern, especially if your performance is tanking as a consequence of too low carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't think that's what he's describing here. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I know he's talking about long events too, uh, but because the, the carbohydrate expenditure and your ability to, to uh, process protein is definitely independent, or I'm sorry, uh, dependent on intensity, mm -hmm. then again, I mean, probably not a concern for him because if he's going for eight or 10 hours at a time or longer, I mean, double century, yeah. 200 miles takes people upwards of 10 hours a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, probably not a limiter, probably not something that's limiting his performance in the moment. Yeah, yeah, I, that's all logical. And then... <clears throat> Um, on, on top of this all, again, we're talking a one-day event, protein intake can be handled ar around the event. And I know it's a tall order when you're talking about being on the bike for 12 hours and now you have to get that uh, 
what's the protein recommendation for endurance athletes is usually between one gram per kilogram per day up to two grams. So one to two grams. And with an athlete my size, about 185 pounds, so 84 kilograms, we're looking at anywhere from 85 to 170 grams of protein per day. And if I'm on my bike for 12 of those hours, it's really hard to get that in during the remaining 12 hours. But again, this is a one day thing. Mm-hmm. You can only do so much right. damage in, in a single day. Um, so uh, just err on the side of performance in this case. Maybe don't even worry about the protein. Just see to it that you're getting enough carbohydrate to fuel the performance. Deal with the protein ramifications later. Mm-hmm. So for Kenny, I think the real question is, does anything actually need to change? Mm-hmm. Um, is he performing to expectation? Is he experiencing GI distress? I mean, he's talking about a half scoop, and I'm assuming that's per bottle. Mm-hmm. So five to 15 grams for, for a half scoop. I mean, mm-hmm. a scoop's typically anywhere from 10 to 30 grams, depending on what you're using. So that puts him down to like a one to six ratio, which that's when you might say, I'm, I'm dealing with a bit of gastric distress because I've you know, far exceeded that ratio recommendation. Yep. Is it an issue? Maybe it's not though. Um, if it's clearing your gut, it's probably being absorbed, right? Mm-hmm. So if it's not hanging up in there, you're probably not doing anything too wrong. And then uh, another question might be to ask himself if he's losing noticeable amounts of muscle mass at the end of events like this. Yeah. And even so, how much can you possibly lose over the course of a single day's event? I mean, even over the course of an Ironman or a triple century, God forbid. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard thing to parse out <laughs> yes. from hydration status too. Yes. Like, yeah. It's just really hard to Didn't say. Didn't even consider that. Yeah. yeah. That's that. <clears throat> and that, I mean, that, that really gets to the like, root of this is it's always hard to, we put so many things into our bodies and we have so many other things that are affecting performance that it is tricky to say. Mm-hmm. So I guess summing it up, Chad, on the, on the protein side, should, if cyclists are taking in protein, does it stop them from taking in or from absorbing carbohydrate? No, nothing that I've found would say as much. Yeah. 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 It's really just a question of, does it impact your capability to intake carbohydrate, you know, do you, can you not take as much carbohydrate as you want to, because you're also combining it with protein, right? Yeah. Is there any GI distress is performance tanking? I mean, sure. Right. Absolutely. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and let us know with a thumbs up down below. If you didn't like us, give us a thumbs down, but let us know what we could do to improve in the comments. Absolutely. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, you should head over to trainerroad.com. It works. True story. That's true. Nate used to be slow and now he's fast. Sort of fast. Not as fast (laughs) as you. Still fast, Nate.